welcome to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. And today we have a happy Thanksgiving show for you guys. This is only for people in the U.S. If you're not in the U.S., you're not celebrating Thanksgiving, but I'm going to wish you a happy, I don't know, over happy large podcast dinner. podcast day. <laughs> or podcast day. Okay. So I hope you're eating well wherever you are. All right. We have got an amazing show for you. This is episode 191 of the podcast. We're going to be talking about Lowe's selling its Iris business, Apple buying a smart home hub business. We're going to be talking about Black Friday, all the deals. We've got a bunch of news associated with Amazon's digital assistant, other news associated with Google's digital assistant, and a new smart home security device, plus a new LG smart display that's out in the market. We're also going to be hearing from our sponsor, Bitdefender, about crazy printers and how they're not secure. And our guest this week is Mike Nelson, who works for a cybersecurity firm, but who is coming to us talking about his role as the father of a diabetic daughter and what IoT device security for medical devices means to him. So it's a really great show. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get it started with a message from another one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is Cognizant. With demanding customers at the center of today's value chain, delivering engaging products and experiences is even more important. Cognizant, a global leader in business and IT services, helps companies engage customers by envisioning innovative products and experiences or inventing disruptive new business models. With those insights, Cognizant collaborates with clients to build smart products, disruptive strategies, and new ways of engaging customers across every channel that uses the power of IoT. Learn more about Cognizant's IoT services and solutions at Cognizant.com slash IoT. Okay, Kevin, let's talk about Lowe's. And this is kind of crazy because we actually had someone calling into the show and asking about what was happening with Lowe's Iris business. This was their smart home business that they started in 2012. So way back in the early days of the, I guess, the resurgence of the smart home and home automation. This was a platform designed solely for the retailer, and there were all kinds of Zigbee and Z-Wave compliant sensors that worked with the platform. And Lowe's actually charged a monitoring fee for the devices, and it actually had a battery. It had cellular connectivity if you needed it. But I don't think it did so well because on its earnings call this week, Lowe's said that they were going as part of a decision to close 20 U.S. stores and 27 Canadian stores. They also said they were going to exit their Alacrity Renovation Services and their Iris Smart Home Business. Ah! And as part of that Smart Home Business and the Alacrity Renovation Services, they're taking a $14 million write-down. So, Which is not a terribly large amount of money in the grand scheme of things for Lowe's. But regardless, I agree with your comment that you said you don't think that the Iris platform really did well, at least relatively speaking. It started out in an era of DIY stuff. But it had a service component and people did not want to pay a subscription cost associated with it. That was the biggest complaint people had. And they also weren't going to support other devices. So they had a whole brand of like Lowe's products, but when it launched, it didn't support anything else. And I think that's the bigger challenge or problem with the whole strategy that they had put into place because we've gone in probably the past two to three years of a very siloed, closed smart home ecosystem to much more open. When you look at our digital assistants and how many brands and devices they all work with, for example, and granted voice assistants are you know just a user interface to get things working. So that's not truly smart home to me, but I think, yeah, keeping it closed the way they did was definitely not the right approach. So just to be clear, even though they're exiting the smart home, Iris smart home business, they will still sell Iris devices, which I'm not sure why, but that's irrelevant. They will also still sell other smart home products at Lowe's. So it's not like when they say exiting the business, you'll still be able to purchase various smart home devices. In fact, I think six weeks ago or so on the podcast, I talked about the store within a store at my local Lowe's. And I presume that by now, a lot of other people have seen them as well, where they're filled with smart home devices, such as those from Google and Amazon, as well as Nest and who else did I see? Philips and Samsung and all kinds of others. So it's just to, it's, I guess, the service side they're kind of getting out of. 
Yes. And owning their own platform, which makes a ton of sense. So I will say Lowe's head of PR reached out to us and she did say, this is important, that for now, they don't have timing or additional details to share. It remains business as usual. There are no changes to Lowe's support of the brand, product, or service as we search for a buyer. That's really important to know because right now your stuff is still going to work. Depending on who buys it though, who knows? It's anyone's guess. So there we go. That's the, I guess that's the big smart home story and kind of a sad close to this this era, I guess. I mean, if we think about it, Staples, they had launched their own platform. They got out of the business. Best Buy had Peak. They got out of the business. Now we've got, you know, I can't think of anybody who's got anything now. We're kind of, you said, you know, when Iris came out, it was more the do-it-yourself kind of era. And to some degree, that era still exists. But this is like smart home. I don't want to say 2.0. I'd I'd rather say 1.1. It's a step forward from then where you've got very capable major platforms that are mostly open. HomeKit is the one I would say is not as open, obviously, because it only works with iOS devices and such. But I wouldn't want to be in the business of creating or servicing or owning another platform right now. Me either. Okay. Let's talk about another acquisition. In This is being portrayed in the media as an AI acquisition, which I think speaks more to the idea of what's hot right now. But this is Apple buying Silk Labs. And this was reported in the information this week. And when I saw it, I was like, Silk Labs isn't an AI thing. They made a smart home thing. And they did. It was founded by Andreas Gall, who was the former CTO of Mozilla. And we actually had him on the show. It was like episode 46. So way back in early 2016, talking about he built a hub and it was a hub to showcase his ideas about building smart home AI services that respected user privacy. And, you know, I had thought this company had died because a lot of these smart home companies are like, yes, we're going to do this. We're amazing. And then like two years later, you check back and they're like nowhere to be found. But Apparently they were well, still plugging along. Yeah, that's because they actually started with a Kickstarter project. And I remember seeing the small little hub box with this curved front and a camera inside it. It looked very, I don't know, Space Odyssey, Space... It looked like Bang and Olsen's gear. It was like super curved and like yes. black and just... Yeah, yeah. And it, it's not that it was even a very closed system because I think it worked with just Wi-Fi and Bluetooth devices. But uh, in- It worked with, yeah, Sonos. It worked with smart light bulbs. Yeah. And a couple of other non-lighting devices, but it just never really took off. And they canceled the product, gosh, maybe actually the same year they had the Kickstarter Yeah, they, so and they refunded the backers. Now that I think about it, that's right. Yeah. Yep. And that's when they pivoted, I remember, to developing AI software. So that's kind of probably where the AI bit comes in as well. So in the key focus, I would say on this is they had you know image recognition. They were doing a lot of things like they could play your music based on your taste. And the idea was all of this would stay on the device. It wouldn't go to the cloud except for key things that, you know, you might want, like, hey, the picture of the guy who was breaking into your house, you might want to keep that in the cloud. So the whole end, and when stuff was sent to the cloud, it was anonymized. And that was actually very unusual back in 2016. So that focus on privacy is probably what Apple is after, being Mm -hmm. able to make a smarter home experience or smarter overall user experience without having to break its, what is now a differentiating stance around privacy and security. Yeah. And if you have time, I would say go hit the Silk Labs website while it is still up because with the Apple acquisition, I don't know that it will be up much longer because you can get a good feel for what Apple is getting out of this. Basically, when Silk pivoted in 2016, it was a way to, hey, we're going to enable cognition for any device that you make. We'll bring the smarts, you bring the device, and that's that. And there's a lot of interesting information here. So cool. Go check it out. Hopefully screenshot it, Kevin. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. We are in the midst of what I'm no longer going to call Black Friday because you know I've been getting deals all week long. So we're going to call this Black Friday week now. And I just want to let everyone know that if you are in the market for a smart home device, there are actually really amazing deals. I would say There's a lot of things you shouldn't buy on Black Friday. They're like, oh, we're going to discount it a little bit. But a lot of the smart home stuff is really compelling. I'm not going to run through a big list or anything. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much everything that we looked at was on sale. And what we looked at were products that we've talked about in the past, 
or products that we've purchased ourselves, have in our homes. And these aren't like, you know, $5 off. Some of these are 50 or more dollars off for whatever the device is. Yeah. So if you are in the market and I will give a plug for this. This week in the IoT newsletter, Stacy on IoT, we are going to be sharing our list of 10 connected gadgets that we think make good gifts. And some of them are for the your parents, your chefs, your industrial IoT designer. There's some weird ones on there that you're not going to find on any other list because of who we are. So you can sign up for the newsletter or you can see it next week. But a lot of those things are going to be on sale. So yeah, go out and get your, if you're on the fence or you're like, maybe I should buy it. This is actually a really good time of year to buy your smart devices. Yeah. My thought is if you had smart home items that you were thinking about buying, but we're just holding off, I'd say pull the trigger now, you know, do it. Do and it. then when you have questions, you can call us and ask us and we will help you. All right. Let's get into some big news for Madam A. Madam A is what we call Amazon's digital assistant. So we don't set off all of yours. So couple news items. Biggest one probably this week was we now have Madam A on Bluetooth headsets, watches, all kinds of other things, which is basically a way to bring Madam A to everything. Yeah, this is, and all the technical details are on the developer blog over at Amazon. They talk about their Madam A mobile accessory kit, which at first we were like, is that hardware? But it's not. We dug around. It's basically a list of hardware requirements for you to actually build in this protocol and service so that pretty much any Bluetooth device that meets the requirements can take advantage of this. So Qualcomm actually has a reference design of headphones. If you're a developer, you can tinker with these, but they'll cost you $300. So I wouldn't do that. And what can we, I mean, like, so for you guys who are like, what does this mean? It means that you could, you know, if your watch has Bluetooth and this protocol enabled on it and supports it, basically, you could be like, Madam A, unlock my doors. And then you have to give your pin. So that's a terrible example. But Madam A, turn off my lights. And you would say that to your watch and it would happen. Or you could do it on your headphones. You could be like, oh, Madam A, add dog bones to my shopping list. You know, those types of things. Right. And some headphone manufacturers have already integrated Madam A. So this may just be how they used it. I don't know. But this, again, opens up the doors to any device maker that meets the hardware requirements, if their device meets them, they can add Madam A. And it's neat how they implemented this because you don't have to have a device that has always on listening. They have that, obviously, listening for the wake word. But if you want to save battery life as a device maker, you could use their push to talk implementation as well. Got it. And that makes a ton of sense because sometimes you're like, oh man, I don't want to be changing the battery on this thing all the time. It's kind of like the tap. Ah, okay. So that's out there. Look for that. I will say, from my perspective, Amazon is just killing it when it comes to creating a really compelling voice platform for both the smart home, for everyday use. I mean, it is doing what I really expect a company like Apple to do, but Apple is totally behind on this. But like bringing this everywhere like this is kind of like Apple's MFI program where it's got criteria for what you need to be like to work with it. It's trying to bring Madam A everywhere, but do it in a way that, you know, as long as you meet these criteria, you can do it. So, you know, yeah. there's a number of reasons they're killing it. I totally agree with you. I just found one out last week, one of probably many. You may have seen this, but I don't know if everybody else did. Do you know how many people that Amazon has working on the Madam A stuff? Oh my gosh. No, I don't. 10,000. Oh, that is a lot of people. I do not recall where I read that, but I caught it last week and it just blew my mind. That is a lot of people. Okay. Yeah. That would do it. So more Madam A news. Kevin, you're going to love it. Let's just let you talk about it. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm so excited. So if regular listeners recall, I bought the Vector robot made by Anki. And I did that through Kickstarter. So I got a small discount and we love him. You know, he's very animated and he rolls around. He's autonomous. So he gets bored if he's just sitting in his cradle, his charger, he'll just go out and play with his Bluetooth cube and whatnot. And we can have him do some fun things, but it's kind of limited so far. However, I have seen a video of the next big feature that Vector is getting, and he's getting it in a couple of weeks, and that is integrated Madam A. And I love it so far based on the video because 
it's very responsive. It's very quick. It's it literally, you don't, and you don't have to say, hey, Vector, like you normally would to wake the robot up and do stuff. You would just say, hey, Madam A. And then you see her little icon show up on his face and ask her whatever, turn the lights off, get me the weather, do this. And she does it. I am super impressed by how it looks so far. And I cannot wait until it comes out. Yes. And I'll just give you guys one of our 10 items on our gift guide is the Anki Vector because Yay. I think we're saying it's for the kid or the kid in you. And, and, and going back to the Black Friday deals, you can actually get the Vector less than I paid for as a one of the first Kickstarter backers. I paid $199. He normally goes for $249. It's $179 right now. Oh my gosh. Hop on that because that is actually a really, yep. like, I had the Cosmo and I thought it was adorable and fun, but it was not as capable. And now I'm like, I have, I have vector envy. Okay. One final bit of Madame A news. This is pretty esoteric, but we're going to throw it out there. Now, Madame A can power on devices in low power mode. So this is like your TVs or whatnot. If they're in low power, you can speak directly to them and they will turn on. It's called Wake on Land Controller. If you want to Google that and figure out the details, but I thought it might be interesting for low powered sensors because these are things that are in sleep mode a lot of the time. And now, you know, Madam A can basically wake them up and get details of something that's happening right now. A lot of time with low powered sensors, it'll send the details to the cloud and Madam A will look at state and be like, oh, like 20 minutes ago when it reported this was the state. But now you could actually get it to wake it up directly and get the state, which might make sense for something like, is something open or closed at the moment? Or something like, I don't know, leak detection. If you suspect a leak and you don't want to get up off the couch to check it out, you can be like, hey, Madam A. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see who implements this in what devices, because for now, Amazon worked with three partners and got some very low-hanging fruit in the television market with Vizio, LG, and Hisense. They're all going to get this feature in the next couple months that'll be rolling out. And yeah, TVs are often in a low power state. And so you just send them a little packet over the Wi-Fi network, wake them up, and then you can do whatever you need to do. But yeah, sensors and other things. I'm curious to see who implements these and how. Yeah, that's just me talking. Final little bit of Madam A news. There is now Skype calling on Madam A. They showed this off actually back in September at their massive unveiling of so much stuff. So this is just saying it's now out there. If I were at home with my Madam A, I would test this with Kevin. But you know, for anybody who's using Skype. Yay. All right. Now let's move on to Google's assistant because it did an interesting tie up with <laughs> Siri. Kevin tried this out. So Kevin, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, so you can now include Google assistant, the app in Siri shortcuts, which sounds great, but the implementation is very much like the way Microsoft implemented Madam A and Cortana, where you ask a voice assistant to ask a voice assistant something. And that's what we have here. So I did set this up. And when I say on my phone, and I'm sorry if I wake anybody's iPhone up, when I say, hey, Siri, she starts listening and I say, okay, Google. And it opens up the assistant app and Google starts listening. So it's kind of a shortcut to a shortcut for iOS users. It can't really do much more, unfortunately, but you know, it's yeah. there. It gets you to Google fast. It doesn't get you faster. Hands-free. It gets you there hands-free because right now you can't actually have an always listening, okay, Google kind of thing on iOS. What I do is I take the assistant widget for those who are familiar with iOS and I just put the assistant widget on my widget screen on my iPhone. So I slide over and tap the microphone button and that opens assistant. This is hands-free though. Right. So that's what you would do if you wanted to get somebody who could actually answer your questions. Yeah. I'm waiting for somebody to do an assistant to an assistant to an assistant. You know, I mean, that's where we're heading. <laughs> okay. G ask, what should we call Siri? Should we come up with a name for that? Guys, send in your suggestions. Maybe we'll pick it. Lady S? Mm, no. Too close to Madam A. All right. Yeah. Don't know. Let's talk about Google Chromecast news. It can now sync music with home speakers, which... You know, that's just a little thing. Some of these are like little news bits. I'm like, yeah, that's... It's, it's that time of the year. News yeah. is slow. <laughs> it's handy. We like it. I don't know what else to say about that. Kevin, you got anything else to say about that? No, I mean, what you can do is you can add TVs and speakers together in an audio group. So if you're playing, say, something on your Android TV or on your Chromecast, audio-wise, you can have it streamed throughout the house now, which is kind of nice. So yeah, it's just another way to move that music around. Ooh, that music. Do, 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 do. All right. Google Cloud, IoT, and Microchip are bringing actually security to microcontrollers, which 
Yay. There's a lot of effort in the space. We've got Microsoft doing some cool stuff with their Azure Sphere product. And what is Google doing, Kevin? So they have partnered with Microchip, which is a company. Well, it is also a thing. It is a company. They've created the AVRIOTWG development board. And all those things actually mean something. IoT, obviously, we know what that means. WG stands for Wi Fi and Google. So, this is a cloud connected 8 bit microcontroller development board that is connected to the Google Cloud platform. So, it's a $29 dev board. It's small, it's not super powerful, but it does have connectivity to the cloud. And they want to help jumpstart cloud based or Google cloud based IoT projects. So, you know, it's another development board. Yeah. Right. And it, the idea is that it will securely connect to the cloud, it makes it a lot easier. You see these all the time. I mean, like every microcontroller and a lot of the, you know, fancier like ARM based chips and even some Intel stuff for IoT usually have some sort of option to link directly to one of the three big clouds, Azure, Google, or Amazon. And actually you see them Mm -hmm. with Alibaba and Baidu as well. So, woo. Yeah. Two little interesting bits about this. They have a coprocessor on there. It's a cryptographic coprocessor for a trusted and protected identity for each device. So you can have secure authentication. And that is unusual on an mm -hmm. microcontroller. And the devices are pre-registered on Google Cloud IoT Core. So you can Mm -hmm. pretty much get them out in the world with zero touch provisioning. Yeah, that is very cool. That is all part of making this easier. So sweet. Okay, moving into cool gadgets that you may or may not want to buy. Abode has a new smart home security device called IOTA. And this is, Abode makes a really compelling sensor. It's a sensor and hub kit for DIY home security. This is a, you know, the closest thing I can think of is kind of like a canary. It's got a camera in it. It's got some sensors. You can add other Abode sensors to this. It comes with optional cellular backup and a connection plan. So the IOTA security device is 259 and that's kind of Black Friday pricing. If you want to put it with a connectivity plan, that's going to be 309. That's your 4G connection for backup and that includes service, I believe too. Yes. For one year. For one year. The cool thing about the IOTA is it's going to have Z-Wave support, Zigbee connectivity, a camera that's 1080p, and again, integrated backup with six hours of battery life if you want it. I mean, their stuff is, their original gear is really good. And this will also connect back to their original gear as well. Yeah. It is very much like the Canary, I think, which is what I have. It's part of this, yeah, this whole security. Like, I feel like we're, I'm surprised we haven't gone further yet, but there's been like, security has often been thought of as like, I need a sensor everywhere. Like, is this open? Is this closed? But companies like Piper, that's now bought by iControl and was then sucked into alarm.com. And Canary and now this are kind of thinking a little bit in a different way. They're like, here's one or two devices you put around your house with connectivity sensors and a camera, and they like listen for stuff that's different and that's wrong and then let you know. And that also included in there is the Echo Guard at Home Guard, where it's going to listen for breaking glass and such. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yes. Yeah. Which if you have an Echo, it's going to get that at no extra cost. So, and I think that's smart. I think Mm -hmm. that's a better way to look at things. So that's just me. So that's out there if you're into that and you want a different type of home security, or if you've got abode stuff and you want the camera functionality and some other stuff. Okay. Other things that are out that we care about. Kevin? A new smart display. Yay. This is a Google smart display? It it is a, yes, Google Assistant built in. So it is a smart display similar to the JBL and the Lenovo ones that have been out for a couple months. We both have the Lenovo. And this is from LG. It's the X-Boom AI ThinQ smart display. How much longer they could make that name, I don't know. But it's very similar to the existing ones on the market. So Assistant is built in. It's got a built-in camera for video calls, which the also comparable Google Home Hub does not have a camera. So just worth a mention as a difference. Chromecast is built in. It's got an HD touchscreen, Bluetooth streaming support. I think the big thing here for LG, it's definitely not design. It kind of looks like a tissue box on its side to me, but that's beside the point. But it does have two big speakers, 
with Meridian Audio's advanced technologies, so probably a better speaker than some of the other ones that are on the market. It's normally priced, and it's brand new, $299.99 for an 8-inch display and those speakers. However, since they just launched it, they've got a promotional price of $199.99. Woo! So that's where the boom comes in, I'm guessing. I guess so, because I'm telling you, it's a tissue box on its side. Eh, you know, speakers, they're not the fanciest design things. So Our Lenovo's are, with the bamboo back and the curve. Oh, no, that's true. All right, they're pretty. Yes. They're pretty. I think I like mine more than you like yours, but... You do love yours. I mean, I like mine, I do. you have... You I have love some, mine. You have Dexter strong. watches TV on it all day long. Oh my goodness. Okay. Kevin's going to be eaten by robots. That's my prediction for the future. All right. So that's pretty much what we've got for you in the news section, but we have an awesome voicemail that ties actually into some holiday spending because we have a loving father who wants to outfit his daughter's new apartment with IoT stuff on the IoT podcast listener hotline, which by the way is brought to you by Schlage. Don't miss your chance to win a Schlage Connect smart deadbolt, which is now Zigbee certified with Amazon key compatibility. You can upgrade your smart home with the safety, simplicity, and style of Schlage. To be entered to win this awesome connected lock, and it really is an awesome, well-built lock, all you have to do is call us at 512-623-7424 and leave us a question and you will automatically be entered to win. We are closing out the November drawing at the end of November, November 30th at midnight Eastern time. So call us before then and you will be automatically entered to win this Schlage Connect Smart Deadbolt. Okay, and now let's hear from Scott. Hi, Kevin and Stacy. This is Scott from Cincinnati. I am interested in getting my daughters started in home IoT. They both, one has an apartment, one has a condo. And I was looking for the best system to get them started with. They're not programmers or do-it-yourselfers. They just want something that they can set up and basically forget about until they need it. We have a lot of Apple equipment, but I'm concerned that for the voice automation, they would need their phones or tablets and they don't always have those with them. So I was interested in your ideas as to what would be a good starter system for young people in their first apartment or condo. Thanks for your help. I'm looking forward to hearing your answer. Oh, Scott, you are a good dad. And I don't know how much money you want to spend. So we're <laughs> we're going to go all <laughs> we, in and you can choose. We could go nuts here. <laughs> we really could. Okay. The first thing that we think you should buy, regardless of what kind of digital assistant you might have for your child or children, rather, is a canary. We just talked about this, but it is a really awesome security system. It's great for renters. You just pop it in there. You can have the camera facing the front door or wherever they might be nervous. The cool thing is it not only has the camera, it has all these sensors that can tell you what's going on in the house, even when they're not there. And so you can see like, oh, there's some weird noises happening in there. And maybe it's not a robber. Maybe it's your dog going nuts. I don't know. But you'll know about it, which is kind of nice. And it is the canary right now. How much is the canary, Kevin? So now is the time to get a canary because they are free with a membership. And I should tell you that I do pay for a membership of my canary. Wait, wait, it's like $10 is, it, a- is it the good one or is it the one without any sensors? All of them. Wow. All of them. So I have the $170 all-in-one. That's the camera and the climate monitor that you were alluding to. But they do have just a regular camera only without the sensors. It's $99. And then the Flex is $199. That's an indoor-outdoor. They probably don't need a secondary camera, but if they do, that's fine. So right now, they're all free with the membership. Holy cow. Go get two. One for each of your daughters. Okay. Yeah. They do have reduced prices if you don't want to pay you know, the service fee and so on. So I think they're all $50. The all-in-one is $50 off. The view is just the camera. That's $50 off. And the flex is $30 off right now. And you pay for the subscription and you find it worthwhile, right? I do. Although most of the alerts, the motion detections and the snapshots of what's going on in my house are my dog running around. So I'll be in class and my Apple watch will buzz in the middle of class and there's Norm running around the house. And in case you're wondering, the Canary has HomeKit support, but it also has limited Google and Amazon support. So what it does is it can tell you like the temperature, but right now it doesn't give you like the visual displays from the camera. However, Canary says that basically they're working on it. They are talking to Google and Amazon about deeper integrations with Canary, but for now, they support Madame A on the Echo Show and Spot for displays and Google Assistant for Google Home, but not with the displays. So there you go. 
So that'll keep the daughters safer. What can they do for, I don't know, seeing in the dark? (laughs) Seeing in the dark. I like that. (laughs) Lighting. We decided that we didn't want to send you down the hub route. So we are going to recommend you buy the TP-Link Casa, that's Casa with a K, smart Wi-Fi LED bulbs. I'm going with, I kind of want colors for them because they're post-college and having some colors is kind of nice. But if you just want to, if you don't want to get too fancy, the dimmable or tunable whites range from about $20 to about $30, depending on if you want dimmable or tunable whites. So those are, I don't know, they're good lights. They work with Google Assistant. They work with Madam A. They don't work with HomeKit. So keep that in mind. A couple bulbs there in their lamps or in their fixtures should be fine. The downside is they will have to leave their light switches on all the time. And if the power goes out in their homes, then you know the lights are going to turn on. Those are the, like the downsides of smart bulbs right there. If they have HomeKit, I probably would say maybe the LifeX bulbs. There's a bunch of choices there. Yeah, but they're super expensive. So keep they are. Well, that's home kit. <laughs> yes, indeed. So there you go. And then we also thought it'd be nice and cool for them to be able to connect their devices to, well, we haven't actually talked about a digital assistant. You should also get them a digital assistant. I don't recommend Siri for a variety of reasons. It sounds like you're fine with that. So I would go with either a Google assistant or Madam A. I would recommend on the cheaper end with a display, the Google Home Hub, that is the brand new. Home Hub. Google. It's the, well, it's the Google branded smart display. <laughs> yes, the Google branded smart display. Right now, it is ninety nine dollars for Black Friday. Normally, it's about one hundred and fifty dollars. So you know that's one option. The other option is going with the Madam A universe, and in that case, you would get probably an Echo Dot, unless you wanted to go all fancy and get an Echo Show with the display or an Echo Spot with the display. I would just do a Dot, honestly. <laughs> yeah, unless they're going to listen to music, then maybe get the full sized Echo. There you go. Like the second gen. The mm-hmm. second gen full size deco, which is very nice. So those two, and now that you've got those, once you've picked your ecosystem, I'm going to say, give them a way to make their television smart because they can build these routines around stuff like movie time and impress their friends when their lights dim and their TV turns on to Netflix. So for that, you're either going to go with a Chromecast, that's like 35 bucks if you're in the Google world, or an Amazon Fire TV stick with Madam A inside, that's about 25 bucks. So plug that in and you should be able to control your television using those options. If you want to retain neutrality, I have a $99 Logitech Harmony Home Hub that works with both of those device systems. And that also covers things like speakers, if they have external speakers and that sort of thing. So So that gets them the basics and it's not terribly expensive. It is not. You've got television, lighting, security, and a digital assistant, which, you know, and if you want to throw in some smart plugs, they're, you know, they range from ridiculously cheap. Like right now for Black Friday, Amazon has their smart plug for like five bucks extra if you buy a dot or an echo thing. Otherwise, it's $25. And for any Google related smart plug, you can go with Wemo or the TP Link Casa. So that gets you started. And hopefully your daughters will open those and love them and feel safe, secure, and... And they they can even communicate with each other using those smart speakers because there's calling built into both platforms. Yes, unless you get one, the Madam A version and the other, the Google version. Dun, dun, dun. Don't do that. So... Don't do that. Don't do that. Just get your whole family sucked in on one device. All right. And all of those can move with them and they're systems that can grow. So that's... You know, you could have those for a long time to come if they want. All right. That concludes this portion of the show. And if you stay tuned, you're going to hear about, oh, printers with malware and diabetes, how the Internet of Things is changing care for diabetes and also why security is becoming so important in medical devices. So stay tuned for all of this and we'll see you next week. Hey everyone, we are taking a break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Bitdefender, and I have Alex Balan, who is Chief Security Researcher at Bitdefender, here to talk to us about printers. Alex, statistics from about 2,000 Bitdefender box units running in North America showed that half of IoT gadgets identified as printers had a weak password. This could indicate that owners never bothered to replace the factory access credentials, or they just chose a really bad password. But really, how much damage could a printer do? 
Well, if it's exposed in the internet, then essentially anybody can access the data on the printer. And while most people don't necessarily realize this, the data on the printer also includes the documents that that printer has printed. Uh, it can even start logging all the documents that will be printed from that point onward. It can make copies of them, send them to a remote location. In some situations, if the printer is vulnerable, it can provide full access to an attacker to the operating system on that printer and enable the attacker to use it as a jump point, as a beachhead, if you will, to attack the rest of the devices in the house. It can even start intercepting communications between the devices, the rest of the devices in the house and the internet. It's crazy. Wow. So it sounds like someone could use this printer to invade my privacy. How could that happen? I would say that a possible scenario would be to, first of all, look at the documents that you're trying to print. And I know that all HR prints are very sensitive documents. And I know that people at home sometimes print very private letters and things that they would not necessarily want other spies to see. Are printers really that smart? Well, yeah, you know, actually, it's a funny thing. You mentioned earlier the part about passwords and credentials on printers. What's really interesting to see is that people don't really perceive printers as being smart devices. And they actually are. And many people don't even know that printers have passwords. But actually, if you access the IP address of that printer, it will be prompted with a user interface that you can set a password to. This is why we're actually, we've implemented a module in BDefender Box called Vulnerability Assessment. And this component will tell you if one device in your house has one of these management interfaces, unsecured or with a bad password that so you should probably get a vulnerability assessment to tell you if your printer or other device in your house has an unsecured management interface. Scary. So what can a user do if they discover this and they want to secure their printer? Well, first of all, obviously, they should set a strong password on that management interface. Second, they can get a Bdefender box. Bdefender box will essentially take care of the printer and the other devices in the house and make sure that they're always protected against brute force attacks. They're always protected against other types of attacks. And also make sure that all the devices in the house, including your traditional devices, will stay protected. Awesome. So where can I go to find out more about Bitdefender? Oh, that's simple. On bdefender.com slash box. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and today's guest is Mike Nelson. Hi Mike, how are you doing? Hey Stacey, I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. Oh, I'm super glad you're going to be on the show because, Mike, you have a job at DigiCert, which we will probably touch on a little bit here, but we're here because... We wanted to talk about using connected devices to help manage diabetes, which I don't know, it feels like a really big life-changing opportunity for people who are diabetic. So talk to us first a little bit about your history with the disease. Absolutely. I'm excited to have this discussion with you. I, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 16. So I've had it for coming on 24 years, and it's been amazing to see the evolution of treatment. I mean, when I was diagnosed, I had to poke my finger and wait for 45 seconds to get a glucose reading, and then I'd have to take a shot of insulin about 45 minutes before I ate to allow the onset. And today, you compare that to the technology and the benefits of some of the evolution that's happened. Today, I get a glucose reading from a sensor that sits on my arm every five minutes and it comes directly to my mobile phone and I get alerts when my blood sugar is going low or when it's going high and the insulin also there's been dramatic improvements in the insulin and I can take a shot right before I eat I don't have to lead up and the insulin gets into my system and becomes active right away so just a dramatic change over the last 24 years and the technology is doing a lot of things to make the management of diabetes much easier Awesome. And for your parents, when you were 16 and trying to deal with this, I imagine that's a really overwhelming thing to have happen is you're like, oh, you've got to be responsible for the 16 year old boy who may be amazing, but that's a lot to deal with. So what kind of tracking was in place? What was your life then? There really wasn't for my parents. And that's the terrifying, you know, my parents, I think, did a remarkable job of encouraging me to be responsible and to stay on top of my blood sugar. You know, at the age of 16, you're not really responsible, but you're getting into that age where you can take some accountability for things. So my parents really encouraged me to, whether I was playing sports, to make sure I checked my blood sugar before I got on the field, or if I was going out of sleep over at my friend's house to make sure I was checking my blood sugar before I went to bed and making sure that it wasn't dropping. But the truth is they had no way of knowing. And the technology is such today where, you know, I travel 
for work regularly. And I wear this, what's called a continuous glucose monitor that has a Bluetooth connection to my mobile device. And then it goes from the mobile device to the cloud. And I can share my blood sugar levels with my wife. So when I'm traveling, if my blood sugar drops in the middle of the night, she'll get a notice. She can call the hotel and help me get the attention that I need. The peace of mind that comes from that connectivity has been just life-changing for me. I imagine. All right. And now, as a parent, unfortunately, you have a lot more experience, not just personally, but with your daughter. She has also been diagnosed with type 1. And actually, before we get to this, we should talk to people a little bit about type 1 versus type 2 diabetes. Yeah. So type 1, it's pretty easy. Type 1 is a disease where the pancreas actually completely stops working. It's an autoimmune disease that's caused by your body attacking the pancreas. Your body just stops producing insulin completely. Type 2 is typically triggered by whether it's obesity or women during pregnancy, but it's where the pancreas actually becomes less effective. And there are oral medications that can be taken to treat that. Whereas with type 1, insulin injections are required to treat that. So it's really, it's type 1, the pancreas completely stops working because the body attacks it. Whereas with type 2, it's just the pancreas can't keep up with the needs that your body has. Okay. And when there's a problem, like when there's too little sugar or too much sugar, you can really injure yourself in both cases. But in type one, you can fall unconscious. And yeah. So if, if you were to take too much insulin, what happens is it just depletes, you know, some of your listeners may have felt, you know, after a, a big workout, you get a little bit lightheaded, you feel a little wheezy. That's typically symptoms of low blood sugar. And your body does a really good job naturally of regulating that uh, because your pancreas only releases as much insulin as is needed. But with diabetes, you have to act as your own pancreas with type 1 diabetes. And so you have to know how much insulin to put into your system. So if you put in too much and then you don't eat enough to cover the amount of insulin that you've taken, it can be catastrophic. I mean, it can it can put you into what's called a diabetic coma where you lose consciousness and it can become very damaging. Okay. So just not to like belabor the point here, but this is something that is really tough to manage. It requires paying attention to a lot of different factors and yep. the consequences are pretty dire. So your daughter, she is four? Yeah, she turned four this year and her name's Olivia and she is just the sweetest little girl. And last year, a little over a year ago, she was three. I was out on a work trip and I got a call from my wife and she said, you know, Olivia's been drinking a ton of water and going to the bathroom like every 15 minutes, which is one of the signs of type one diabetes. You try to actually, your body's natural response is to try to flush the sugars out of your system. And so you get really thirsty and try to consume a lot of water to try to disperse the sugars. So she was having that symptom and my wife called and said, you know, should I take her into the doctor? And my heart just sunk knowing what the symptoms are. You know, I hoped for the best, but thought it was probably the worst and came home and gave her a little finger poke. And sure enough, her blood sugar was really high. And so we kind of self-diagnosed her and then took her into the doctor and they confirmed that she was a type one diabetic. Uh, and so what does that mean for a child? What does that mean you have to start doing? Yeah. So diabetics require insulin. So before every meal, Olivia and myself take the right amount of insulin to cover the food that we're going to eat. And so my sweet little four-year-old, we started by doing a finger poke and she's now emerged and is now using connected technology. So she no longer has to do finger pokes, which has been amazing. But we look at her blood sugar and see where she is. And based on the readings that we get, we will administer a certain amount of insulin to try to keep her blood sugar in, in the right range. And so we do that. And then it's just continuous monitoring. She goes to school. She's in preschool. And so when she goes to school, we send her a little meter with her so that we at all times have connections. We know what her blood sugar is at all times. She goes to a friend's house. When she goes to tumbling, we send her little meter with her and it gives us the peace of mind of knowing at all times what her blood sugar is. And so, you know, aside from the insulin, the injections and that, it really is a disease that you just have to monitor and you have to pay attention to and do the right things to keep your blood sugar in the right range. Okay. And right now there are lots of options out there. I know that there are definitely connected options out there that let you monitor your own or someone else's blood sugar fairly non-invasively. And then there is a whole subset of parents and people out there who have kind of hacked together their own devices to do this. So talk to us about the options that are out there and what kind of factors you think about as a parent. 
Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's really just knowing at all times where her sugar is. And I mean, the fact that I could put my phone down right now, Stacy, and pull up and see where her blood sugar is, is such, I can't tell you the peace of mind that I get because if I didn't have that and she goes to tumbling or she goes to a friend's house or she goes to school and if she has a glucose reaction and she goes low, she legitimately could pass out and nobody would know what's going on with her. And so having that data in front of us and being able to track it at all times. And it's not just there, but it, my phone will start beeping at me if her blood sugar starts dropping too quickly. And so it's almost a preventative way to get in front and to track. So these things called continuous glucose monitors are a great innovation. Aside from glucose monitors, you know, I think that's the most exciting innovation that I've seen over the last 20 years. The next is really what's happening with insulin pumps right now. You know, insulin pumps have been you wear them kind of like a pager on your belt and you program the amount of insulin that you need and it administers it through a tube that's connected into your belly at all times. And, you know, insulin pumps are a great way to manage, but insulin pumps now are starting to develop smarts where they have the capability when your blood sugar starts to go up, the insulin pump is smart enough to detect that and start to administer insulin. And it does that through a connection it has with the glucose monitor. So the glucose monitor, in addition to sending the reading to my phone, it also sends it to the pump. And the pump reads that and then makes a decision based on the levels and can help you self-correct to keep you in the right range. And it's just amazing technology. And you know the benefits of being able to manage the disease with those types of technology is just awesome. It's probably comforting to have this level of data available to you on your phone. Are there things that you are concerned about or that you're kind of like, well, it'd be nicer if it did this? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think every time I pull up my phone and I look at a glucose reading in the back of my head, just because of what I do professionally, I think, is there integrity with that data? You know, is that accurate? You know, the consequence of that not being accurate, Stacey, is if her glucose reading comes to my phone and it says 350 and her blood sugar is really 100 and I administer her insulin based on that reading, that event can be catastrophic. And so that's, you know, from utilizing glucose monitors, that's my biggest worry is just the integrity of the data and making sure that the readings that I'm getting are valid. And so that when I treat her and give her the insulin, it's going to do the right thing. Right. So that data doesn't get up to the cloud and then somehow get sent to the wrong place or your data is mixed up or anything like that. Yeah, or a man in the middle attack where somebody manipulates the data and it, you know, it ends up with an incorrect value. Gosh, true crime stories. I can see these now. Yikes. Yeah. Okay. And I can't even really rely on my like home automation systems to work in concert like that. So I still have problems making sure that when I leave my house, my lights actually turn on like they're supposed to after sunlight set. So the idea yeah. of relying on something for your safety and your daughter's safety, especially, that feels very fraught. So how do you evaluate? Because these are connected products. Are yours connected to the internet or do they have a cloud connection? They have a cloud connection. So they're both, they have both a Bluetooth and then, you know, a Wi-Fi connected out to the cloud. Okay. So you are the head of IoT security at a company called Digicert. So it's not like you're... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's not like you're a normal person <laughs> running through life going, oh yeah, this yeah. is cool, this internet connected stuff. So how do you evaluate yeah. the security of these things? Yeah, you know, I consider myself a unique consumer in that regard, where I don't think most consumers, when you go and buy these devices, are thinking about the security posture of them. And if they're vulnerable to malware or man in the middle attacks or getting in and taking control of the device. I don't think many consumers, and I don't. I really don't think consumers should have to worry about that, Stacey. I'll tell you the story. I mean, I went in when my daughter was diagnosed. They require diabetics. You go into the hospital and they get the blood sugar under control and they do education and they do that through infusion pumps. And as we took her in, she was connected to all of these medical devices, some of which I had direct knowledge of kind of their security posture and what they're doing. And, you know, it occurred to me how personal security on connected devices can become for consumers very rapidly. And, you know, I've been working to solve these challenges for four years in my profession in all different verticals. And all of a sudden I was hit with this very personal dilemma of, my gosh, like, what if something were to happen to this device while my daughter's connected? What if someone were to get control of that infusion pump and were to manipulate the amount of drugs that are being administered to her? 
those things and the results of those can be catastrophic. So as a consumer, I try to take a deep breath and say, you know, I don't believe that there are malicious actors in this hospital trying to kill my daughter. And even though I know the security vulnerabilities in this device, I had to take a deep breath and say, you know, I don't think the risk is that high because of a lot of different factors. But those risks, depending on the circumstance, risks can be real. And so as consumers, I think education and understanding things that they can do with personal devices, whether it's good password practice, you know, making sure that hard-coded credentials aren't part of devices or, you know, those types of things. And I think education is important. But ultimately, Stacey, I really think that the burden needs to be on the manufacturer. I don't think when you were to take your kid to a hospital or when I took Olivia, I don't think I should have to ask, hey, is the device she's connecting to that's being used to treat her? Is that a secure device? Most doctors would look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. And most doctors wouldn't even be able to know. I mean, they'd be like, uh... no, they wouldn't. There's, yeah, there's no way they would. And so I believe as consumers, we have the right to assume security and safety. And if that security and safety isn't there, the manufacturers need to act responsibly to get them to a place where they are secure and safe. Sure. Now let's talk about as a consumer, not just in the hospital, but when purchasing, you know, insulin pumps and glucose monitors, continuous glucose monitors for your daughter. Did you, one, were there lots of options? I mean, this this is kind of a prescription device. So I'm like, could you actually legitimately evaluate based on security? Yeah, you can. I don't think most consumers can. I mean, you could call the company and you could ask and they could tell you about, you know, the different types of communication protocols and what they're doing to secure those. And you could ask them if the data is being encrypted. But most consumers don't know how to ask those questions. And you have to get the right person on the phone, on the other end of the phone to be able to properly answer those. Yes, because I can tell you, I talk to people all the time and I'll ask these questions and they're like, "Uh, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. Yeah. It typically takes a couple of phone calls to get connected to the right person. And I do believe that that's going to become more transparent. I think that manufacturers, and we see this, manufacturers starting to disclose the things that they're doing around data encryption, password practices. Those are two that are really low-hanging fruit. But, you know, I think consumers need to be aware of those and either go to the website to look to see if they say anything about it or ask the question to them. You know, I mean... I'll tell you, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, is getting stronger and stronger on their requirements for connected devices because of some of the exploits that have happened. And so I think the FDA is working really hard to provide that assurance that I talked about that consumers should know that these devices are safe. And I think the FDA is working really hard to figure out what mechanisms they can put in place and tests and checks to make sure that the connected devices that are going out on the market are secure. What kind of messaging or how do you think manufacturers start trying to convey what is really complicated to consumers? Like, is it like a good housekeeping seal of approval? Some people talk about things like a nutrition label for data security. I really don't know. It all seems kind of daunting. Yeah, it is. And I've heard a lot of discussions around what type of stamp and really there's no clear, I would not say that there's any strong evolution or any organization that's making a lot of progress there. I mean, right now the FDA approval on a medical device is the stamp of safety that people are looking for. But the challenge is a lot of devices that were approved by the FDA five years ago are now getting hacked. And so I think devices that have been cleared in the last couple of years have a lot better security protection than ones say five or 10 years ago, they may still be used in a hospital. Okay. I'm going to put my faith in the FDA. Meanwhile, you can put your faith in- <laughs> And other regulatory bodies. <laughs> yes. Uh, and other regulatory bodies. But I think the FDA is really globally in the team there that is working on medical device security. I think they're demonstrating a lot of leadership on a global level for other regulatory bodies and other countries to follow. Excellent. And there is really nothing more personal than hearing about you know, your story or your daughter's story. I mean, these are clearly people's lives at stake and ah, it's worth it. Okay. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. Hey, Stacey, thanks so much. It's an important topic and I appreciate you giving it some attention. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week. 